Hi, this is Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. Welcome to our 15th installment of the Torah, Torah portion of the week. We're holding in Parsha's bow, a packed Parsha, talking about the last of the plagues that Pharaoh and the Egyptians get, and then they're going to eventually let the Jewish people go, the last of the plagues being being Machis mm-hmm. Bechoros, the slain of the firstborn, and all the firstborn of Egypt was killed, and then Pharaoh sets, lets them go, is going to send them out. Uh, we also have the mitzvah, the first mitzvah of the Torah, which is... Uh, Rosh Chodesh, that's the first Rashi that Rashi explains at the beginning of creation, right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that why does the Torah start with uh, with creation? It should have really started with this verse over here, beginning of chapter 12, right? The mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, of the new month. And so Rashi answers basically that God giveth, God taketh away. Since God's in charge of the world, he created the world, so he has the right to give land or take land um, away. That's why it was important to start with that and not start with the first uh, mitzvah. We go into much more detail in our um, in the first parsha that we spoke about in parsha's uh, brashas. So there are a lot of things to focus on, but I want to focus on one, you know, basically one thing, one one main idea about the exodus from Egypt, and it comes from the last verse. So if we look at the end of parsha's boat, chapter thirteen. Right, chapter 13, verse 16, it says, And it shall be a sign upon your arm, an ornament between your eyes, uh, for with a strong hand Hashem removed us from Egypt. Right, so it says it should be a sign upon your arm. What is that? It is the mitz, it's the mitzvah of tefillin that goes on your, on your hand. If you're left-handed, it goes on your right hand. If you're right-handed, it goes on your left hand. And you place it between your eyes. Right, these totafot, which don't have any... Um, Right, impossible to know what totafot are without a uh, oral translation. But again, we understand it to be um, tefillin. It's a tefillin shel rosh, the tefillin that you put on your head, um, and it goes between your eyes. Right, that's why up here has to be totally clear. All you men who put on tefillin, right, there shouldn't be a barrier up here. So many people are stringent to cut the hair very thin up here, so you don't have a problem that it should be a barrier between the tefillin and the forehead. So, by me, I don't have a problem because nothing there anyway. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the Torah ends, the parsha here ends with the mitzvah of, of tefillin. Now, there's obviously a, ca- a connection, right? There should be a connection between everything we set up until now, you know, with the plagues, you know, etc., and everything going on in Egypt. So this, right? We got we got all the mitzvahs of the Passover and the Paschal offering, right? They had to kill they had to kill the sheep in order to get out of Egypt, which uh, we may get to or we may not. You know, we'll see. But um, everything up until this point is talking about the mitzvah of you know basically of coming out of Egypt and all the plagues, um, etc. So the obvious question is, what what is what is Phil doing here? Why why mention Tefillin, right? We mentioned it's an ornament on your arm, right? It should go between your eyes um, as well. Uh, in order to show you that God took you out of Egypt, comes along the Ramban, famous, famous Ramban, at the very end of the Parsha, Nachmanides over here, uh, says, um, he says that the essence of the mitzvah, the root of the mitzvah over here of coming out of Egypt, Right, we should mention the coming out of Egypt by 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 putting th- these words in tefillin. Right, it should go on your arm, it should go on your head. Right, it corresponds to the heart and the brain. Right, when you put on tefillin, let's say if you're right-handed, you put it on your left hand. Right, so the tefillin is going to be on the on the arm here, right on the upper side of your arm, right of the muscle, and it's going to go outward. Why is it going to go outwards? Because it's going to correspond to where's it going to, where do we want, where do we want the power of this to go to? It's going to go to the heart, right? And we have the tefillin of the rosh of the head, right? Corresponds to the brain, right? So here the Ramban says, so you have the mitzvah of tefillin. We talk about the coming out of Egypt. Um, and the mitzvah of tefillin corresponds to your heart, right? Goes on your side again, on your arm, right? On the top, or the, the, on the muscle, and it goes on your head, right? Corresponds to the brain. So, 
Inside tefillin are compartments. And in the compartments, there are different, what we call partiot, that are written. There are four that are written. And the four partiot are written on a cloth, on a on um, a specific type of parchment. And a sofa, a scribe, um, will be very careful in articulate um, and how he writes them. It has to be written in a certain way. There are a lot of tremendous amount of laws that go into um, A, making tefillin, B, writing the parchment. Um, just as a short side point, you have to know that if a person does buy tefillin and you want to wear them, obviously you should get them from someone who is authorized to sell them. What does it mean someone who is authorized? Someone who knows what they're doing. right? Someone who is versed in the laws of tefillin. I'm not sure what phylacteries are, that's how they translate it in English, but we'll call them tefillin because it sounds nicer. Um, nonetheless, you should only buy tefillin or a mezuzah, right? A mezuzah goes on the doorpost of every doorpost in your house. Anything that has like a, as an ark, has like a doorpost um, in your house, except uh, you don't put a mezuzah on the bathroom, right? In the bathroom door you don't because if it's facing in, then it's kind of a disgrace for the mezuzah. Um, you know, it's got God's name and it, it's facing, you know, inside or it actually is um, inside the bathroom. So a mezuzah is also important because the parchment itself um, and how it's written, ha again, like, like tefillin, they have to be written a certain way. The person writing them has to have a tremendous amount of fear of heaven because... You know, if you take this parchment and just scribble on it all these words, it means nothing, right? You have to know what you're doing. There are laws that are, you know, that are guiding what is supposed to do, what is, how it's supposed to be written. Not only that, name of God is written also. That's why any scribe who writes has to go to the mikvah before it, right? He has to dunk himself in the mikvah for extra holiness, for writing the Shem Hashem, for writing God's name. But we're not going to speak too much about about mezuzahs and tefillin. We are, we are going to speak about tefillin in the sense of what it relates to coming out of Egypt. But the most important thing that we're going to take out of this right now is the fact that if you buy tefillin or you buy a mezuzah, right, it should be bought by from somebody that has fear of heaven. Because if he doesn't have fear of heaven, then it'll be like Mickey Mouse writing it. It doesn't matter. It'll have no, you know, it'll have no validity. Right, and it certainly should go inside a covering, so the covering doesn't, you know, so it won't get damaged if it's too hot or or gets wet or the outside gets wet. I remember telling someone I saw a picture they were putting up a mezuzah, or the picture of them putting up a mezuzah. So I said, don't forget, the most important thing about putting up the mezuzah is the parchment. The outside thing makes no difference. You can spend a thousand bucks, you know, five hundred bucks, a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks on the casing of the mezuzah. If the if the if the casing is so nice and beautiful, but the parchment is written on it by somebody who shouldn't be writing it, or it's not kosher, whatever the case is, then your million dollar box is all, that's all it is. It's a box, right? So you know, I said tongue in cheek. You know, make sure there's there's parchment inside it, so it can be a kosher mezuzah. Like, hi, what you think I don't know anything, right? You don't think I know anything? So, obviously, I didn't answer the question, but I wanted to make sure they were aware that the most important thing is not the outside, is what is on the inside. Nonetheless, come along the Ramban. Nachmanadi says that in these four compartments, you have verses that talk about the coming out of Egypt. You have the Shema, you have Ayayim Shemoa, right? The first, the, um, um, the first paragraph. Or a second, really, the second paragraph. Right, the first paragraph of the Shema is the Ahafta is Hashem Elokecho. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the second paragraph, by am Shemola, that you should listen to the mitzvahs. And if you don't listen to the mitzvahs, it's going to be reward and punishment, um, etc. So that goes in. That goes in the tefillin um, as well. Um, and we're commanded also in the mitzvah of totafot. Right? What are totafot? Totafot are, are tefillin. Um, 
just like it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. It says, I thought the fault, bang, ain't echo. Right? These words which I command you this day, you shall place them on your heart, and they should be tota fault, bain, ain't echo. Again, we can speak for the rest of the time the importance of oral tradition. We're not going to do that. Right? We'll hit it at different times. You know, why why oral tradition is important. Here it says, What in the world is tota fault? Right, so Raji here says, obviously he's talking about filling, there are four boxes, and what is totafot? The, the word tot is in an African language, it means two, um, etc. Because otherwise we wouldn't know what it means. Right, they, again, it's translated as phylacteries, I have no idea what a phylactery is. If you find one, let me know. Right, but, but totafot, in general, we know as tfilin, but it's not a normal word. Right? It's a word that doesn't have any comparison to any other word in the Torah. As Rashi says, it comes from a different language. So, here we write, the Ramban says, write two partios, two cloths, two parchments um, in the Totafot, right? In, in the Tefillin. What are, what, are the, what are the two things we write? Um, obviously there are more, but the two here he mentions are the mitzvah of Yichud Hashem. What's Yichud Hashem? Yichud Hashem means that God is one. God is unique. Right? One of the 13 principles of faith of Maimonides, of the Rambam. And that is, there's no other being like God in the world. There won't be anyone like Him before and like Him after. Right? Obviously, you know, if the world gets destroyed, who was there before the world was created? God. Who will be there after the world is destroyed? God. Right? So He's unique. There's no other being like him. He represents the entire world. He can run through a black hole, come out the other side. He keeps the world going. Right? He is nature. Right? We'll see as the Ramban explains. So, there's not more than one God. There are other powers in the world that God controls. They don't, there's nothing outside these of him. Meaning, these other powers are created by God, but they're not independent. Right? The Ramchal, Ramosh Chaim Mutato, says in Derech Hashem, says it clearly that these other things were created for whatever reason. They have no power for themselves. Therefore, God created them for whatever reason He created them, but they can't act outside their own nature. So as we mentioned before, you know, the Atlantic Ocean says, I want to make a tsunami, make this big earthquake, and we'll destroy half of Southeast Asia, put Atlas back on the map. God can say yay or nay. If He says yay, well, Atlas, you're back in business. If He says nay, game over. Right? So the ocean says, I'm going to do it. God says, oh, really? You think so? <clears throat> Can't move. So God says, come on. Do a little bit more. Wind. Come on, wind. Bring it out. Let's go. Right? So the ocean's like, I can't move. I can't do anything. That's right. You know why? Because you're limited. And the fact that you're limited means I control you. So if I say no, the answer is no. That's it. So that's one thing, one idea that comes out of um, these these parchment that goes into filling, and the other is the remembrance of the mitzvah and punishment that we get. In other words, the the mitzvah for what we do and the punishment if we don't do it. Right, the merit we get for the mitzvah and the punishment that we get if we don't do the mitzvah. Right, because remember, there are repercussions. Torah says, if you look at the second paragraph of the Shema, if you do my commandments, great. If not, I won't bring water. It'll be terrible for you. Right, we see in the book of Deuteronomy, it says it a number of times. Right, go in my ways, choose life, not death. Right, if you choose death, well, you know, that, that's your choice. So they say, where's my free will? Of course you have free will. No one's a robot. You have the right to go one way or the other. If you want to go one way, so good. Things will be good. If you go the other way, things will be bad. We say it's not fair. That's why God set it up. Take it up with Him. Right? So, there's reward and punishment. The reward, normally, we're going to get in the next world. Because the Talmud says, Mitzvah Baha'i Al-Malaika. A mitzvah in this world, you there is not. Right? What does it mean? There is not. It means you don't get the mitzvah in this world. You don't get the merit of the mitzvah in this world. Because... 
what's the what's the what merit you get for the sake of the mitzvah in this world? The mitzvah itself. That's it. It's really for the next world. And the reason we're doing the commandments anyway, no one's going to do it and say, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to die so I can get my merit in the next world. We're doing it because we believe it's the absolute will of God. Right? And the mission of Berke Elbow says it's better to serve God for the sake of, even if we didn't get any merit in the next world. Why are we doing it? Because we believe it's the right thing to do. And if you were saying, I had someone once tell me, Many years ago, he says, well, when I die, I'm going six feet under. I said, well, I hope for your sake you're right. Because if I'm right, you're in big trouble. Right? There's reward, there's punishment. There, you know, there'll be judgment, etc. So this person turns around and said, what would happen if I were to tell you, or if you, sorry, if you were to find out after 120 years, when you die, nothing happens. What would happen if that would be the case? My language, person dies, he goes, poof. Like a dog, right? Dog doesn't have the same soul as a human. Won't get judged. He goes, poof, nothing happens. No offense to any dog or animal lovers um, out there, right? That's it. Unless a person, you may say, a person may be reincarnated into that dog. So when the dog dies, the soul goes out and gets judged or whatever because that would be reincarnated in that dog. That may be the case, right? That certainly could be the case if we're talking about reincarnation. I'm not talking about reincarnation. Right? I'm talking about a simple thing. Dog, what soul does a dog have? It has an animalistic soul. That's it. That means, that means that it doesn't have the spiritual soul that a human has. Because he is DNA. That's all he is. Programmed DNA. Can't go outside of what he's programmed to do. You know, no offense to the shaggy DA. Right? So, you know, human turning into a dog. Dog is a dog. That's it. Uh, again, unless he's reincarnated. But let's not let's not get sidetracked here. So if a person dies like a dog, he goes, poof. Nothing happens. So the person said, so what's going to be? If you find out after 120 years, nothing happens. Right? There's no Om Habas, no next world. There's no merit for anything you did in this world. What do you have to say? I said, if that's true, which I think you're wrong, but if that is true, then at the very least, I live the most moral life I could, you know, I could in this world to the best of my ability, and there was nothing, nothing greater than that. Even if, God forbid, it's all not true, find a better system, a more moral system that, that continues for all generations. And it's able to be passed down to all generations. If it's done right. Doesn't seem like there's anything else out there that even compares. So, so that's one, that's another thing. We talk about the, the Yichud Hashem, God's uniqueness. We talk about uh, the mitzvah of punishment and reward. And what's the whole foundation? The Ramban says, what's the whole foundation? The foundation over here, the root of it, is what we call emunah. Emunah means belief in God. That's why it says, I'm going to make you this sign. You're going to put you're gonna put it on your arm and on your head. Right? It's going to be a sign. And it's going to be a sign to put on your arm because that's going to correspond to your heart. So, when you put these boxes on, quote-unquote, boxes or tefillin as they're known, right, all you men out there, and you put them on your arm, right, you put it on the muscle, and it turns in, and it corresponds to the heart, that means whatever's in those boxes should make a, should make a Roshim up here. Meaning, it should go into my heart, and through my heart I should get it up here. Also helps if I wear them on my head, directly related to the brain. Because through osmosis, what's written in there, and all the laws that go into making tefillin in general, the holiness should exude from what I'm wearing and should go into my brain to turn me into the person I need to become in order to serve God. Because isn't the essence of what is written inside all about God? Right? It's about Yichud Hashem. It's about Emunah. It's about God taking us out from Egypt. 
It's about reward and punishment. It's about absoluteness. It's about reality. Our reality. Regardless of what else goes on in the world. Pretty powerful when you put on filling, I would think. Right? Unfortunately, most people, you know, you get them on, you pray, you take them off. Right? We don't get really the entire benefit we should. Again, we're busy. We're running. Day in and day out. So, of course, I have an obligation to pray. Have to go to synagogue. Right? Have to dive in with a minion, with ten men. So, regardless when that is, and how early that is, it doesn't matter. This is your obligation, except on Shabbos or a festival. You don't put on tefillin. Why not? Because tefillin is called an oath. It's called a sign. It's a symbol. It differentiates us. Well, Shabbos is also a symbol. Right? When we make Kiddush, Shabbos Day. And we say that Shabbos is an oath or an oath. He Leoilo. It's a sign between me and you, God says. So if Shabbos is already a sign, I don't need another sign. Therefore, Tefillin is forbidden to be worn on Shabbos. Um, so the Ramban continues. Um, and he says that. Uh, uh, uh. That he says the importance of tefillin, that when you put the tefillin on the head, right, it's, it corresponds right here to the brain, and it surrounds the whole head, right, because you got the you got the straps that go all the way around the head. The main thing is right here, right. It goes right here and it has to be straight. That's why you might see people go like this, or you might see people go like this. To make sure it's straight. Because, you know, there are ways to put it on. If you put fill in it, it goes over here. You haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. Right? It's going to be right on the brain. Right? Right on top. So he says it covers the head. Right? The straps cover the head. There's a kesher. There's a... Um, it's tied. Right? It's tied in the back. And it hits the bone. I don't know if you can see. Right? It hits the bone right here. In the back. Makes the shin dalid, right? They got God's name there. Um, and it says it should be between your eyes. It means in the middle of your head. Not on one side, not on the other. Again, important for a for a running commentary. Because all it says over here is it should be between your eyes. Well, what if I put it right here? Or what if I put it right here? That's also between my eyes. Or I put it over here. So he says, no, it has to be right here, corresponding to your brain. And if you don't do that, you put it to the right, you put it to the left, it's no good. Right, that's why you'll see people have a mirror and they're very meticulous to see where, you know, where it is. Because if it's not straight, it's no good. So here the Ramban continues. And he says that when we look at the mitzvahs in general, when we look at mitzvahs in general, they're very specific. Right? Obviously, they're interpreted in a certain way, but they're very, very specific. How they're supposed to be done, you know, what happens if you don't do it right, you know, you, you exempt, you're not exempt, you fulfilled your obligation, you didn't, it's complicated. Right, it comes to blessings, comes to Shabbos, comes to Kashrus. There's a lot to learn. Right, it's not all straightforward. So here, here, the Ramban says that when we look at mitzvahs in general, many mitzvahs, right, they have an order. And it's supposed to be done in a certain way. And he says, though, there was a mistake that was made in the time of Enosh. Like the, like the Rambam says. At the time of Enosh, they made a mistake in Amunah. They made a mistake. He made a mistake in Amunah and God. They were they, they denied God. 
And they said, what? They said that the world had a predecessor. It wasn't God. It had a predecessor. Right? It doesn't mean God was the predecessor. And they contradicted the fact that, they, that before the world, who was there before the world? Right? So we hold, God was there before the world. What was he doing? He was building and destroying other worlds. What does that mean? We don't know. <laughs> he was doing all kinds of things. We have no idea. All right, but he was around before the world. They want to deny that. They contradict it. Right? As, as, as they'll claim, how do we know? Is it God above? Maybe the world just came, out, came, came into being. You know, without God creating it. So basically, they deny not only that God didn't create the world, but they deny there's such a thing as reward and punishment altogether. Right? They want, they want to deny that as well. Also, they want to deny miracles. Right? Nature, in reality, is a miracle. That God keeps everything going and continues to keep everything going. Nonetheless, they want to deny that as well. Because if they were to say that God created the world, the age may I, and something from nothing, and He created everything within it, and the, and the celestial beings in heaven, you got the sun, the moon, stars, planets, etc. If you say that it's a miracle, then you're giving credibility to the fact that not only someone created that miracle, but that miracle continues. And it continues. And it's you know and it'll continue as long as God wants it to continue. Once you admit someone's there at the beginning, then you have to say it must be an all powerful being. If you say he's an all powerful being, then you got a big problem. Because then you, have to, then you have to say, you know, God exists. God runs the world. Right? You read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. He comes to the conclusion that the world must be an expanding universe. If it's an expanding universe, that means they'd have a start somewhere. They just come out of nowhere. Right? Even you hold the, the Big Bang theory, for instance, or where the Big Bang come from. Right, not a contradiction to Torah, but you have to have to explain who made the Big Bang. But in his conclusion, he says, "Well, if we say it's expanding, then it looks like the creationists are right, because if it's expanding, then there's something causing it to expand. From where did it come from? And with all the scientific proof, that's the that seems to show a tremendous amount of evidence that's the case." And if that's the case, what's the ob what's the logical conclusion? The logical conclusion is, well, who made it that way? God himself. To which he says, you know, you can't be rational and believe that. Right? We can't say, obviously he's involved in science, right? So you can't say, you know, that's true. Because otherwise the creationists are right. But he just wrote a whole 350, 400 page book giving different scientific proofs trying to show that that's the case. All of a sudden, you get a drop of cognitive dissonance and you say, but no rational person should believe it. So what you're saying basically is all the rational proof I use, forget about it. That means I'm a fraud. Maybe you are. <laughs> Maybe that is the conclusion. Because how could somebody bring scientific proof and then deny it because, you know, rationally you shouldn't believe it? What do you mean rationally you shouldn't believe it? You just proved it according to science. You gave all this evidence. All of a sudden I should be irrational and not believe it? Obviously there's an agenda there. Be that as it may, 
Be that as it may, the Ramban continues, and he says that for these people deny God, they deny Hashkacha Pratis, which is what the exodus from Egypt is. Hashkacha Pratis is divine providence. And they deny it. And they'll say, God's too big, he's too lofty, he's too great. Maybe he made the world disappear. Maybe they won't be, they won't deny God altogether. They'll be like Pharaoh and others say, yeah, there is a God who created the world, but he disappeared. He's got more important things to do in heaven than deal with, you know, more mankind. So he gave his other powers to deal with whatever he needed to deal with. And he disappeared. So whatever happens, you know, he's not controlling it, right? So that's heresy, right? We don't believe that. You know, if, if someone made a huge skyscraper, you think he's going to disappear? Someone who's, who's rebuilding the Twin Towers and did all the designs for it, he's going to be there every step of the way that it's being built. And after it's built, he's going to walk away? He's not going to walk away. Why would someone who built something so, so great just walk away? Because, oh, I'm too great, I'm too lofty, I don't need it. I'm going to go my, I'm going to go my own way. It wouldn't make any sense. But they made that mistake. Because they thought he's so great, he doesn't have a connection to man. Right? Again, one of the 13 principles of faith. Man, God knows the thoughts of men. And he cares what man thinks, what man does. And because of our actions, there are, there are repercussions. So, the essence of what I wanted to get to, to what the Ramban says. Is that, when he talks about the miracle. And the plagues are definite miracles, no question about it, right? Because the entire nature was changed in order to destroy the Egyptians. Now, God needed to do that because according to nature, the Jews shouldn't have got out of Egypt. That's why Moshe didn't want to go and take them out. Because he looked up to heaven, he saw according to the stars that an angel of God and an angel of the Egyptians, each nation has their own guardian angel. And they were intertwined like this, like a double helix, right? Like a DNA molecule. Right, double ladder like this. Moshe Rabbeinu looks up and he says, God, what do you want from me? According to nature, they can't come out. It's never going to happen. A hundred times out of a hundred, put this whole thing in a supercomputer, it, the Israelis, the Jews stay there. They'll never get out. Impossible. So God says, Mo, says, Moshe, what do you think? I run nature. I'm in charge of nature. You think I can't change it? You think I can't make the Nile turn to blood? Or frogs come all over the place? You think I can't do that? I can do anything! Right? I showed you the stick trick. Right? Stick down snake, grab it, back to the stick. Put your hand in your bosom, comes out white as snow. Plenty of things I can do. So God tells Moshe, don't worry about it. According to nature, you're 100% right. Jewish people will never get out. It's a good thing I don't run according to nature. I'm above nature. I created nature! Therefore, I can take them out above nature. That's why I have all the miracles. Above nature. But what's the point? The point is, he says, that you're going to know I am God in the midst of the land. Right? Take a look back. Chapter 8, verse 18. God says, I am in the midst of the land. To show what? The Ramban says to show Ashkocha. That he runs the world. And that he didn't leave it for one iota. For one split second. Right? If God leaves or takes his mind off it for one split second, the world goes back to, to Tovavu. To chaos. The original chaos. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Right? What, what does chaos mean? It means we're not all here. We're destroyed. Looks like the back of that Led Zeppelin album. Right? Fog. Chaos. Death. Nobody around. So he says, what, do you think I created something and disappeared? You should surely know. It says in verse 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 29, that Laman Tezaki Lashem Aretz. The world will know the world is mine. In order to show that I, I create the world and I can change it. I am nature. I'm above nature. I'm outside of nature. I can make it rain when it's sunny. I can make it snow when it's not cloudy. I can do anything. So the whole world's going to know for what I do that I run the world. That the world belongs to me. That I create the world from nothing. 
And that there, everyone will know there's nobody like me in the world. Right? That's why we wear tefillin. That's why the parchment go in tefillin. That says that I am unique. There is nobody like me. So when you put those tefillin on, it reminds you of what you're doing, what your purpose is in this world. Right? And God also doesn't do miracles in the eyes of someone who's evil or someone who denies Him. Because people would say, if you'd only show me a miracle, right? If you only show me a miracle, then I'll believe. God, I don't have to show you a miracle. Why? Because you're so evil. I have to show you a miracle that's going to make you change? Miracles don't make people change. He said, you have to remember, I run the world, I control nature. This is something you're going to pass down to all future generations. That's what Passover is. Right? We do all these things commemorating coming out of Egypt. We have so many myths of the Ramban. The Ramban says, everything to show you that it's testimony that you should never forget my miracles. Because the miracles were done for that generation. So what did they do? They told the next generation, we saw these miracles. And then that generation told their kids, we saw the miracles. How do you know? Because my father saw it. And then they passed it down to their kids. And every Passover Seder, there are four generations. Great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and child. And one time, that great-grandfather was the youngest child. If you have 80 of those generations, it goes back to the giving of Mount Sinai. One event in history that has unbelievable repercussions for so many things that we do. So, for generations, we pass this idea down. God intervenes in history. How do we know? How do we know that God intervenes in history? That there's such a thing as Hashgacha Pratis. The reason we know is because he took us out of Egypt. That's also as the Minchus Chinuch says. The Minchus Chinuch is a work. Or the Chinuch is a work. Not quite clear who wrote it. But he wrote according to each parsha. The mitzvah is in the parsha. So, so in the parsha, the Ten Commandments, parsha is Yisro. That there's a mitzvah to believe in God. How do you know the mitzvah to believe in God? Because he says, because we learned out from the Ten Commandments, he took me out of Egypt. I know God because he took me out of Egypt? Yeah, because he intervenes in history. Why don't you say I know God because he created the world? That's better, bigger. Because no one was there when he created the world. We had 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60 saw him do all these miracles, not including women and children. So about 2, 3 million people. And they pass that down generation to generation. So if you deny, you deny the miracles so you shouldn't forget, right? You deny God. You deny God intervenes in history. And if you spend a little bit of money, the Ramban says, and you put up a mezuzah on your door. Right? You fix it on your door. And what's your intention? Every time you walk by that door, you kiss the mezuzah. What are you kissing the mezuzah for? So they oh, it's a good luck charm. Really? It's a good luck charm. You know what a good luck charm is? It's like a rabbit's foot. We don't believe in good luck charm. What's a mezuzah? Divine providence. Hashkacha pratis. God runs the world. God intervenes in history. That's your intention when you put it up. And if you put it up without a parchment, <laughs> you're kissing a box. It could be an expensive box. It could be a Gucci box. It can be beautiful. It can cost you a thousand bucks. But you're kissing a box. If it's got the parchment in it and it's done right, what are you doing? Every time you kiss it, you're showing that God exists in the world. You're showing that you believe in divine providence. All right? That's what the Ramban says. You're giving credibility, so to speak, that God renews the world and continues to rule the world. That's belief in Torah.
That's why the Ramban here says, he says, says in Pirkei Avos chapter 2, Mishnah, not Mishnah 10, I think it is here. It says, be careful with a mitzvah kala kebachamura. Be careful with a light mitzvah, so to speak, and a stringent mitzvah, because all of them are special. That every time a person does a mitzvah, he's doing it because of his belief in God. Again, less intention, more intention, but that's what he's showing. Why, why, why would you do it otherwise? Because it's a nice custom. It's a, it's a myth. It's this. It's that. No, we're doing it because we believe it's the absolute word of God. Even if we don't do it to the best of our ability, whatever the case is, why, that's the only reason you're doing it. You know, imagine someone kisses that box every day and says, ah, I can't wait to get my portion of the world to come. World to come. World to come. World to come. Right? Kiss the mezuzah. Kiss the mezuzah. Do another mitzvah. That's not in the front of our mind. You do the mitzvah because it's the right thing to do. You believe the absolute word of God. It's not a five-year option to renew. It's not if I feel like doing it, fine. If not, not. It's the real deal. Right? You're a Jew. You're born a Jew or you convert. Right? So, you have to keep everything. Whatever is applicable. To the best of your ability. Oh, I want to rip it to shreds. I want to make fun of it. I want to mock it. I want to do it when it's convenient. It's not Judaism. Right? That shows you kiss the mezuzah. I believe in divine providence. Who are you kidding? Giving a lip service at best. You know, does it mean we always reach the highest levels? No. But see, if you're going to pick and choose, it won't survive. Right? We understand why it won't survive. Now, the last thing I wanted to get to here, which really I think is the most important thing, and the scariest thing, the Ramban says like this, and of all the miracles, the great miracles that we see, and that we're seeing in front of our eyes, meaning what happened in Egypt, a person is moide, he, he agrees with all these miracles, right? Even the miracles that are hidden, right? Even the miracles that are hidden, that's the foundation of Torah. Right, all these miracles. It's the foundation of Torah. Even if one generation way back when saw it and they passed it down, that's the foundation of Torah. Isn't it true? One event in history. Rewind rewind the video. One event in history. And I'm going like this. Right? One event that's passed down. So we're saying I agree to that. Like God needs my agreement? No. But when we do it, that's what we're doing. Whether it's a hidden miracle, whether it's a revealed miracle, it doesn't matter. We're, we're 3,000 years later. Right? And every year, on the 14th of Nisan, we're going to get together and have a Passover state. We're going to commemorate that. Coming out of Egypt. Right? Because our parents wouldn't normally lie to us. Maybe in this generation it's different. But most likely, parents wouldn't lie to their children. Because they like, Dad, how do you know this story is true? Because my father told me. Or how does he know? Because his father told me. Ooh, sounds like a big game of telephone. Yeah, it does. But at the end of the day, you go anywhere in the world. <clears throat> you go anywhere in the world. Three matzahs, four cups of wine, right? Big cup for Elijah the prophet. It's all the same. No matter where you go. Some customs may differ here and there. The main things are all the same. They don't change. One event, unbelievable repercussions for what we do. Says the Ramban, says the Ramban further, a person does not have a portion in Torah, or let's be more specific, in the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, until he believes everything that's in the Torah are all miracles. And that there's no such thing as nature. And that the world runs by itself. Whether it's something that was done to the many. Whether it's something that was done to a few. Right? The purpose of doing mitzvahs is what? It's because everything is miracle. There's no such thing as Teva. There's no such thing as nature. Nature is God. Nature's not outside of him. Nature's also a miracle. I heard a great rabbi once say, what's the difference between, between nature and miracle? 
frequency. Very profound. These words are extremely famous by the Ramban. Because let's call a spade a spade. The Torah is miraculous. There are so many things in the Torah that are written that could not have been done by man. In an impossibility. Torah has to be divine. Not, not the time to go through all the different proofs. Maybe we'll do that one day, but we're not going to do that now. But the Ramban here says clear. As a Jew, you don't have a portion in the Torah of Moshe until you believe everything is miracle. If you believe Saturn was out of orbit, or the Jews ate the same hallucinogenic mushroom in the desert, and that's where you know we came and got the Torah. Or you believe, or you believe that the sea split because it was high tide. The way the moon was set up, whatever, it was high tide. So they say, well, maybe that's a natural explanation of how, of how God did it. Maybe. Maybe that won't take you so far away. But if you say it was a natural occurrence, says the Ramban, any aspect of the Torah that you yourself hold is of natural occurrence means you have no portion in Torah. You deny God. Because you're saying there are things that are natural that are outside of Him, and that's not true. There's nothing outside of Him. He wills things, or He doesn't. Right, because if he's in control and everything goes through him and nothing happens by accident, that's what he's saying here. There are no mikrim. Right? Mikrim means something happened by accident, by chance. Right? Who believed that? Amalek. That's what they brought to the world. Suffolk. Doubt. Right? Whether, you know, they don't believe in God at all. They don't believe in divine providence. And that was Haman's downfall because... If you look at the book of Esther at the end, when he's pinned on Esther's bed, and he's pinned down by angels, the Talmud says, he can't tell Achashverus, i got angels here that are pinning me down, because he doesn't believe in angels. Right? Amalek doesn't believe in the supernatural. Killed by his own motto. Can't deny divine providence, and you can't say everything happens by chance. Because if you say everything, some things, not even everything, if you say certain things happen by chance or its nature, you have no portion in Torah. Doesn't mean you're not a Jew. Let's make that clear. You may be misguided. You may be wrong. Right? But you're still a Jew. You want to convert, God forbid, to another religion? You're still a Jew. But here you deny this simple thing. You don't have a portion in Torah. Not having a portion in Torah doesn't mean you're not a Jew. Right? Let's make that clear. But the Ramban's language is very strong. Because the Ramban wants to make a point. And the point is that God runs the world. There are no accidents. Every bullet has its place. Every missile has its place. The reason why some people have difficulty with this is obvious because if God controls nature and God controls every aspect of the world and God is good and he wants to bring his goodness to the world, why do bad things happen? Right? Why is there tragedy? Why is there sickness? Why is there you fill in the blank? So people don't want to hear that reality. People don't want to hear the repercussions for your actions. People don't want to hear that there's such a thing as reincarnation. And if God forbid, you know, God forbid we see tragedy or we see things that we don't understand. There are repercussions. We can, we can explain mentally challenged people. 
You know, why should that happen? Everything's calculated. Everything's measured. If we don't believe in the soul, in the soul getting punished or getting reward or getting judged or whatever the case is, then yeah, that doesn't make sense. But if there's judgment and there are repercussions and there are things measure for measure, even if we don't understand them, then that's real. And they have to be fixed up. All right, this is all Kabbalah stuff. We're not going to get too much into Kabbalah. But there's a basic idea. You deny this, you don't have a portion in Torah. Because at the end of the day, you're denying that God runs the world. Because you, because you have these t-shirts that stay with a big finger like this pointing saying, STUFF HAPPENS! And what would a Torah Jew say? Not my book! Not what written here! Stuff don't happen! God makes it happen! We just may not like it too much. And that's because we don't understand. But we have to see the bigger picture. So when we see the whole parsha, the Ramban says, miracle after miracle, and then God says, I'm going to harden his heart. He's going to let you go after this one last thing. Makis Bechorois. The slain of the firstborn. Miracles. You know, what a coincidence. All the firstborn happened to die. Of the Egyptians, not one Jew dies. What a coincidence. Says the Ramban, every mitzvah has its purpose. Whether we understand it fully or not, doesn't matter. But look, there's one mitzvah coming out, there's you know, one idea coming out of Egypt. Look at all the things we have from coming out of Egypt. Boy, what a coincidence. Says the Ramban, no such thing. You want to say there's coincidence? You want to see that you want to say that there's nature? The Ramban says you're Amalek. You belong to the people of Amalek. They believe in chance happenings. The Ramban says, You want to believe that as a Jew? You don't have a portion in Torah. You kick yourself out of Torah. Because the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu says there's divine providence. There are hashkacha pratis. There are actions and there are reactions. And that, when we put that into ourselves and we act on it and we put on that tefillin when we say the Shema and we think of what God does in the world we're infused with it. We pass that down every year at a Passover Seder. But you see, life's not easy, so you have to make it real. And even if things are hard, you still have to make it real. And that's why the mitzvah of, or the coming out of Egypt, is so important and there are so many repercussions from them. Anyone interested, I also give... Uh, conversion classes, take a look at my Facebook page at Beyond Orthodox Conversions of Judaism. You can take a look at my blog, RabbiChaimKaufman.blogspot.com R-A-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M um, C-O-F-F-M-A-N dot blogspot.com Everyone have a great Shabbos.